my message is uh, is that people have been doing AI and machine learning for 400 years. Um, so I, I don't have anything new to say. I'm just going to remind you. So um, it goes. So so my theme is uh, what's a parameter? It means different things to different people and in different applications. And I guess I'm going to show you two senses of parameters. So there's a metaphor. So Richard Feynman talks about, uh, he was explaining to non-technical people what he did as a physicist. So he used a metaphor. He said, think of someone who's ignorant of, of the rules of chess or go, and he observes, uh, he watches two pieces, people playing one game of chess. And from those data, he's asked to, refer, to infer the rules of a game of chess. Um, that's what he said he did. He did. So uh, the relevance of Richard Feynman's metaphor for economics is it's not a metaphor. It's exactly what a structural economic statistician tries to do, informed by the work of game theorists, going back to von Neumann and Morgenstern. So from incomplete descriptions of observations of prices and quantities, an economic statistician wants to infer a game that generated those prices and quantities. That's structural macro, or it's structural econometrics. So what's a game? Fine terms. It's lists, lists of several things, players, their available choices, their payoffs, their information sets. It's a timing protocol, who chooses what, when, and it's an equilibrium concept, almost always a Nash equilibrium. So, uh, Physics metaphors uh, have been used by economists, giant economists. I'll just mention two, and I'm just going to I'm just going to copy them. Um, von Neumann and Morgenstern, Chapter One, and T.C. Koopmans, um, one of the inventors of an important machine learning algorithm called Optimal Transport. By the way, they describe two types of statistical models. And I'm going to just, I'm just going to repeat them. They described something, th this is their language, the Kepler stage and the Newton stage. The Kepler stage was a, was a, a, a purely descriptive model with parameters des that des are designed to curve fit. That's what Kepler did. Uh, that's what Galileo did around 1600, so it's been done. And so what was Galileo doing? Uh, he made up a table of numbers, and he fit a curve to them. He fit a quadratic, and he discovered this astounding law, the law of constant acceleration, which is one of the inputs into Newton. He didn't understand why, he curved fit. The Newton stage is to build what you call a structural model with parameters that are characterizing physical invariance. And that's continued to today. You may think of the standard model, which has, I don't know, 47 or 55 parameters that they claim are invariance. Okay. So, I don't know what I'm doing. Oh. So there's, there's a, a physics metaphor and parameters. I'll just give you an example of two types of models. There's, there's Kepler's third law, which is beautiful. It's that the time that it takes a, a planet to go around uh, for um, the sun is equal to a, an invariant constant for Kep Kepler times the cube of the distance from the sun. So he discovered that by very sophisticated curve fitting on, on, on a data set that a big data person named Taiko, Taiko Bra had assembled a little before 1600. Um, and, then, and, and then here's Newton's interpretation of Kepler's law. 
he, he, he purported to build a deep structural model. And what he did is he, he had a formula for K, which is that one, and he related to, to a, gra a gravitational constant. That's what he did. Now, you could ask, good economic theorists do this all the time, uh, how deep are the micro foundations going to be? And did Newton really have deep micro foundations? And uh, he, he didn't even say he did. They were deeper than Kepler's, but uh, go to the 20th century and, uh, and the 21st century. So, so the distinction between a, uh, a descriptive and a structural model is always tenuous. Okay. So, uh, uh, imitate, so what, we're, what economists try to do is they try to imitate Feynman. They try to imitate Feynman. Structural economists. So my friend Robert Lucas just passed away. So um, so in macroeconomics, he urged us to do this. So here's what he said about whether this program uh, to be like physicists is a good one. He says, on a little reflection, it is difficult to feel any general optimis optimism as to the solubility of this problem. By the way, David Hume said the same thing uh, 300 years ago. But he says one would have, he gives an example, one would need to know a great deal about pigeons in order to construct a robot which would serve as a good imitator of an actual pigeon in Skinner's experiments at Harvard. As time series econometricians, we are in a position of attempting to do exactly that using observations only on pigeons in their natural environment. If any, okay, now, if any success is to be possible, it will clearly involve some boldness in the use of economic theory. I could end my talk there. Because I'm not going to say it. I'm going to say it worse than he did. Okay, so let's talk about machine learning. And again, I think I think Galileo or Kepler were machine learning. So, what's modern machine learning? Uh, it's great in marketing. It's great in marketing, yeah. uh, and other things as well. So, here's its components. Just strip it down to its components. It's got some data and labels. Uh, the the data are the x the x's and y. It's got two great big vectors. And what does it want to do? It wants to learn a function mapping the data into the labels. Function f. So that's, in general, that's an impossible problem to solve. It can't be solved. We'll come back to that. So what it does is it, it, it uses, a, it uses what the prior or a prejudice or a theory, uh, of some kind to, to list a parameterized set of possible functions, f belonging to this parameterized graph. And the, and the parameters, theta, belong to some big set theta. So what's the parameter? I told you. It, it's pinning down one of those functions which you, as a prejudiced researcher, put down. And then it turns out there's something called the curse of dimensionality. So don't believe me. Uh, there's this, I think he's a genius, Mike, Michael Bronstein. Who's, uh, who's a pioneer in geometric deep learning. He talks about the, the five Gs, grids, groups, graphs, geodesics, and gauging. Those come from physics uh, and, and, uh, and, and differential geometry. What he says is simple arguments reveal the impossibility from, of learning from generic high-dimensional data as a result of the curse of dimensionality. That's also Chris Sims' uh, PhD thesis at Harvard. Okay. So, but what he says, he read, he says, while that's true, there is hope for physically structured data where we can employ two fundamental principles from physics, symmetry and scale invariance. And then his whole book, is about how symmetry and scale invariance are the tricks 
that are being used under all the very successful um, neural networks and machine learning. Um, and his book describes that. So, a convolutional neural nets, recursive neural nets, um, their trick is to impose those things. Okay, so. I'm doing that. Oh, oh, so, I added something. How do you cope with the curse of dimensionality? You have the curse of dimensionality. How do you cope with it? You cheat. You cheat. You add fake data in, and you dignify the fake data by calling it a prior. Um, it's called, and, uh, or you call it regularization. Um, and there's good reasons to do that. Uh, there's, uh, there's, there's deep statistical reasons. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you, this is my talk. I'm just going to repeat what I said before. Um, but Galileo and Kepler and Newton knew this, and they knew what they were doing. There's two types of priors. There's geometric priors, and what those are, are their, uh, their, their composition. So what I've written down is a neural net. All a neural net is a composition. It, it represents E, G, as a composition of an H, a G, a K, an H, a G, a K. It just uses composition of functions. And then how are you going to estimate the function, least squares? And, and what are you going to do? Well, you're going to have to differentiate that composition of functions. Well, you better remember the chain rule. Um, but don't call it the chain rule. That won't sell. Back propagation will. Okay. So that's what it is. So, so this book, which is at the frontier, that geometric book is unifying a whole bunch of things that seem to be different, and they're really the same if you look at it the same. That's what he's on to. And he's, um, he's doing sophisticated, uh, uh, so you design the architecture, you design the architectures to build in symmetries and invariances. Symmetries and invariances are the same thing. That's Noether's theorem. Okay. So, what's an economic prior? That's very different. So, a geometric prior or a descriptive model prior, there's a good reason to do it, but it's not an economic prior. That comes from von Neumann, Koopmans, Lucas, all sorts of other people, Pacus, Rust. So, what's an economic prior? You posit a dynamic game with a small number of parameters and variants. Those parameters now, what do they describe? Players' payoffs and physical constraints. Then the hope is, observing one, a fraction of a play of this game, you try to infer, play, you, you use, you try to infer their equilibrium strategies, and then from their equilibrium strategies and your knowledge of the structure of the game, you try to infer back those parameters. The cross equation restrictions of rational expectations of econometrics. And then you interpret those parameters as invariants that allow the economist to study consequences of historically unprecedented economic policies. So, Alibaba does that every day, and Amazon does, when they do dynamic pricing. That's what they're doing. And, um, I know that. Okay. So, um, those two types of priors, there's common desiderata, there's invariance and regularizers. That's the role. Okay, so, so now I just, I'm going to skip some slides. This is all detailed. The geometric priors, they do uh, really clever things. And what's interesting, here's a the thing. Theorists and uh, nerdy, geeky mathematical people should listen to a to applied people who are actually doing things in the trenches, in the trenches, because they came up with really clever things that then guys like uh, uh, Bronstein uh, figured out what they were doing. So these things were done before the theory. Tran uh, graph neural networks, CNNs, they do things like translational invariance. That's what they're doing. Pooling, um, uh, permutation invariance. Um, so everything the applied guys were doing, they had some had really nice interpretation, and that interpretation really 
aided the acceleration of uh, machine learning algorithms. Okay, so that's what that's geometric economic example. So I'm going to give you an economic example that's contemporary. Okay, it, it's contemporary now. I just got a, a message from a, a former. He's a distinguished economist. I'm not going to tell you his name. He told me the Argentine law of inflation. The higher inflation gets, the more theories about this cause are proposed. Okay. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you some data. With the data, in my field, uh, these obsess people like me. Um, the data. There's mu, the rate of growth of money creation. It's going to be a, a sequence. That's what mu is, the rate of growth. Pi is the rate of inflation, the actual rate of inflation. And my data is I'm going to show you uh, time series for those two. That's all. Okay. And now. Behind the seats, because I have to give this talk, I'm going to play God or nature. I'm going to show you some inflation uh, sequences that I'm going to pretend were generated by nature. I confess, I generated them for now, for the purpose of this talk. I'm nature. But then in a minute, we're going to pretend we don't know it. Okay, so in these inflations, they were, they're observed by a statistician. Oh, I mean a data scientist observes these sequences. And there they are. Their sequences, I could have written them out. They, uh, I generated them with those parameters. There's a D and a G. So I only know one piece of math. Difference equations. That's just a linear difference equation. A couple of parameters. I, I generate data and I simulate it. And now I give it to the data set. So a descriptive model, I could give this to a, a good descriptive data scientist and he or she would fit a neural net. And they'd end up doing very well. They might be proud and they might say, Tom, I, I fit this thing with, uh, uh, you know, 300 billion parameters and it was no problem. And it fits like a glove. And um, so, so what their problem is, is uh, that may, maybe I say you can do better than that. I give them this functional form. I actually give them this functional form. You don't need 3 billion. You just know, you have to know the G0, D1, G0, and G1, four. And now if you just fit a particular functional form, you can nail those parameters. They can do that. Okay, that's descriptive. But now I ask, uh, that's the Kepler stage. And there's plenty of people doing that, uh, working at central banks, making good living doing that. And then when they're asked to interpret these parameters, they, uh, they blush. So there's no reverse engineering of the rules of the game. They're what a great Harvard, interpreting those things, Leontief at Harvard said, you're doing implicit theorizing, I can't follow you. Okay, so now, let's do an economic prior for inflation dynamics, following the steps of Lucas. Well, what we want to do now is we want to reverse engineer the rules of the game, and we want parameters that are invariant to alterations in the money supply growth process. Why? Well, if they're Argentina, they have 70% inflation a year and they don't want to have it. So they want to change what they're doing and they want to do something that for them is historically unprecedented. So, so uh, fitting, fitting the history is not enough. So what they want, um, okay, so, so what they want is they want to do what von Neumann said. They want lists of people. So we're going, to, we're going to have an economic prior for inflation. The people are going to be the private agents who are holding the money, central banks, and treasury officials. You've got to say what their preferences are and their constraints. You're going to have a timing protocol. Who chooses what, when, central bank, treasury. And we're going to have a Nash equilibrium. And then we're going to back out. So our economic prior, we're going to have a function to estimate. And it's going to be a list of parameters that these parameters, they describe the monetary fiscal uh, authority's purposes, they describe tax distortions, and they describe something about private agents' demands for money. And when you do that, uh, what you get is you get that the parameters of this 
the statistical descriptive model are actually themselves functions of the parameters of the deeper model. That's the whole point of it. So that's what we do. And let me see if I have. Uh, okay, so the the whole end, whole my whole my uh, my whole talk. I just repeated what Galileo and Kepler knew. There's two classes of priors. They both have uses. They're distinct uses. Uh, Koopman said, uh, Koopman said very, in a beautiful thing about measurement versus theory. He said, if you have a geometric or a descriptive model, do not fool yourself to think that you're done. You've only set the stage for someone like Lucas or Kepler to come, uh, Lucas to come along. Thank you.